for how we can move innovative ideas to market. Um, and this is an example from UNC Chapel Hill, and I think it's actually very timely given the, the last business panel we had and their discussion on the need for uh, more support resources and entrepreneur, um, entrepreneurship support for new businesses. So. Research Triangle Park uh, represents one of the most promising opportunities for the development of a successful entrepreneurial network, uh, mainly because it's already known as an innovative region. I'm Ted Zoller, I'm an associate professor at the Keenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and I'm the director of the Center for Entrepreneurship here. My research uh, relates to entrepreneurial networks. Specifically, I've identified uh, deal makers, individuals who are serial entrepreneurs, individuals who uh, build multiple companies, uh, who invest in multiple companies, who operate in multiple companies. I find that deal makers are actually critical catalysts to bring entrepreneurs and investors together, what you'll find is uh, regions such as Silicon Valley and Boston that have been celebrated for being entrepreneurial success stories uh, have a great and high density of deal makers, whereas regions like Research Tribal Park have relatively smaller concentrations of deal makers. My hope is that the Western Entrepreneurial Network will help remedy that deficit and actually bring the capability to identify entrepreneurs in the market and help them be successful in scaling their ventures. University innovators aren't necessarily entrepreneurs. In order to make a successful entrepreneurial venture, you have to bring people who have done it before, uh, people who are savvy, who are facile, and people who are connected to the marketplace. Research Triangle is very good at forming companies and building the early stage company, but it hasn't had the success of building and growing those companies. The Blackstone Entrepreneurial Network promises to be the catalyst to take early stage companies to growth and long term to success. My dream for Research Trial Park is it will be the entrepreneurial success story of the next generation. Um, I believe that all the ingredients are here to make that possible. Okay. So now it's my pleasure to um, introduce our next panel, it's a very exciting panel. I don't know if you noticed in your program um, all of the photos and I commented to Steve and some of the others that we have an avatar and I mean leave it to our free choice learners and creativity to actually have really interesting um, pictures as well so I, I really enjoyed that. Um, and so I'd like to introduce the moderator for this session, Stephen Saucier. He's the Executive Director of the North Carolina Grassroots Science Museums Collaborative who will um, be moderating our final panel session. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the people behind the Science Summit. I hope this is the first of many. I'd like to thank Sarah for her quarterbacking this uh, incredible uh, conference and for Anita seeing the vision for it. And uh, thank you for coming and staying. I'd also like to thank uh, members of the panel. Uh, Dr. Robert Corbin, Hillary Davidson, and Lucas Gillespie. I'm going to try to do justice to them and try to give you a little background on them real quickly. Uh, Dr. Corbin is a Doctor of Philosophy in Curriculum and Instruction with an emphasis in Science Urban Education and a National Board Certified Teacher serving as Vice President of Learning Experiences at Discovery Place in Charlotte. Uh, Dr. Corbin is a North Carolina Science Leader Fellow, North Carolina Leadership Assistance for Science Education Reform Faculty Member, or LASER, National Science Resource Center Facility, I'm sorry, Faculty Member, and a founding member of the Bank of America Teaching Fellows. Dr. Corbin also serves as Associate Professor at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and Adjunct Professor at Wingate University. He's an Arts and Science Council Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, Krista McCullough Fellow, North Carolina Science Leadership Fellow, Duke University Soria Fellow, and a good fellow all around. <laughs> I actually wrote that in, so. Um, no, and it has been an outstanding resource uh, as I get my feet on the ground with this organization. So thank you, Dr. Corbin. Uh, Hillary Davidson is Director of Sustainability and Community Affairs for Duke Energy and is responsible for directing Duke Energy Sustainability Outreach Strategies. Uh, Ms. Davidson earned a bachelor's degree of science, de science degree 
Bachelor of Science degree in Geology from Emory University and a Master of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. Uh, she currently serves on a number of boards including Discovery Place uh, and the Charlotte Area Science Network or CASM, University of North Carolina at Charlotte Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Education Advisory Board and UNCC Ideas Center and the UNCC Civil and Environmental Engineering Department Advisory Board. And Lucas Gillespie. Lucas is an instructional technologist for Pender County Schools in North Carolina. Mr. Gillespie is an avid gamer and he is passionate about the integration of video games into the learning environment and using games as a model for instruction. Mr. Gillespie is the founder of the Wu Win, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Wow Win. I missed that all week then. Uh, the Wow Win School Project, a program designed to explore the educational potential of online games like World of Warcraft with middle schoolers, and he leads one of the largest school based Minecraft implementations in the world. Mr. Gillespie is an internationally recognized speaker on the topic of games and learning, and he shares his experience and resources on his blog called Edu Realms. Please help me welcome the panel. And real quickly, I just want to uh, let you know that I represent an organization. Um, uh, I'm honored. I get to represent uh, directors and museums that, are, that actually do the work. Uh, I represent uh, 35 science facilities across North Carolina. It's the only state collaborative of its kind, this nature. And it really, well, one of the things that we are trying to find is our foot within this educational uh, ecosystem. And it's the only statewide collaborative of its kind. And we really think we have uh, a great deal to offer. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Fran Nolan, who uh, really laid the foundation for uh, this work. So thank you, Fran. Uh, this panel is uh, going to focus uh, attempt to focus on uh, free choice learning. Uh, you may have heard a, a term over the years called uh, informal science education. We don't like that term necessarily because that means there's formal and informal and there's a hierarchy there that might be implied that we don't necessarily like. And one of the terms that's sort of overtaking that is uh, another term called free choice learning that was developed by uh, Dr. John Falk. And what we're going to attempt to do is uh, to see STEM education through the eyes of the learner. Now we talk many times about uh, the STEM education pipeline, but let's spend a little time, hopefully with this panel, uh, looking at the, the learner as they navigate their way through this STEM pipeline, and, and what, what are the drives that occur there. And also explore the role of free choice learning in helping North Carolina become a global leader in science and technology. Now, to establish the framework for this coming discussion, I've prepared some notes, so if you'll bear with me, I just want to uh, use the, this, uh, these notes that I'm about to share with you to frame the, the conversation. I've used some information from several researchers and thinkers on intrinsically motivated learning. First of all, uh, building on the work of Intrinsic Motivation by Daniel Pink, he states that most of us believe that the best way to motivate ourselves and others is with external rewards, the carrot and stick approach. But in his book, Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Really Motivates Us, Daniel Pink claims that that is a mistake. The secret to high performance and satisfaction at work, school, and home is the deeply human need to direct our own lives, to learn, and to create new things. He is drawn on four decades of scientific research on human motivation, exposing the mismatch between what science knows and what schools and businesses actually do. He demonstrates that while carrots and stick works successfully in the 21st century, I'm sorry, 20th century, that's precisely the wrong way to motivate people to meet the 21st century challenges. And in his book, he suggests three elements that drive true motivation, and that is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. In the landmark article called The 95% Solution by Dr. John Falk and Lynn Durkheim, uh, they draw on a large base of research and demonstrate that by the time U.S. citizens are young adults, they are better informed about science than their international peers, and that most of the source of scientific knowledge is not schools. The informal infrastructure of museums, aquariums, broadcast programming, hobbies, national parks, and other sources 
of science exposure for which the United States is richly endowed is far more a potent source of public understanding of science than has been previously acknowledged. The authors argue that we must reckon with and absorb these findings if we are to achieve the goal of greater understanding of science. And in a, a very important work by Jolly and Company called the ECC Trilogy, they focus on the access to science and mathematical literacy as powerful predictors of economic success. They point out that standalone efforts that try to improve student academic performance or increase student interest in certain careers will only have limited success. It is the, com the combination of engagement, capacity, and continuity. Now, in the STEM scorecard you'll hear, I think it's engagement, um, persistence, and development in the wrong order. Um, of these, uh, they stress engagement, and uh, they define engagement as having an orientation to the sciences and related disciplines that include such qualities as awareness, interest, and motivation. The authors and, authors and researchers, Tony Wagner and Teresa Ambal, have developed what they call the culture of innovation. And they have created uh, a diagram here of thinking of, uh, that includes three elements, expertise, creative thinking skills, and motivation. Expertise in, in this area really does uh, focus on the skills development, science and technology, STEM education, skills development, while creative thinking skills is what we refer to as the competency skills or 21st century skills or as I think wrongly termed uh, soft skills, uh, thinking skills, problem solving skills, communication skills, writing skills, working within groups. But both of those cannot advance optimally if you don't have the motivation that drives them. And then lastly, these ideas and the role of informal science education or free choice learning has been recognized by and is increasingly being recognized by authorities, one of them being the National Governors Association, where they put out a, a, an issue brief called the role of informal science education, uh, the uh, state education agenda. And they state that informal science education can be an effective tool in a broader STEM agenda to help states achieve their goals. It raises student interests, confidence, and classroom achievement, generates student interest in pursuing STEM studies and careers, and evidence shows that teacher professional development at informal science institutions can improve effectiveness in the classroom. So with that framework being laid out, I'm going to ask several quite detailed questions of the panel. I'm going to start with Dr. Corbin. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Corbin, you are the Vice President of Learning Experiences at Discovery Place, so you represent a classic illustration of free choice learning. What can you tell us about what drives people to seek free choice learning experiences? What compels visitors or participants to expend time and resources to seek out and gain free choice learning experiences? And what is the change or potential transformation? So first off, it's a privilege to be here. And uh, this is a great first step. I cannot tell you how excited I am about the Senate scorecard. This is definitely a watershed moment in my mind. So thank you for the privilege of being here. Uh, so I have a 12-year-old son. His name is Elijah. Elijah doesn't wake up in the morning and say to me, Dad, I'm really bummed out because I know that today when I leave school, I'm not going to be competitive with the Chinese. <laughs> what Elijah says to me is, Dad, I want to be inspired. I want to have wonder. I want to have fun. I want to create. This is a central question. And this is a profound question that informal science asks. That is, what is the role of the learner? What is the reason that uh, I am going to be engaged? And there's a profound difference between, quote, unquote, informal education and formal education. If we don't engage guests in informal education, we see the backs of their heads. If it's not fun, if it's not creative, if it's not wonderful, they leave, right? So why do people engage in informal science institutions? Because we normalize science. Um, I do a, use an instrument called the DAF to draw a scientist test, and kids, actually all Americans believe 
that scientists do very, very diabolical things. <laughs> that they explode things, catch things on fire, collapse a few people, torture animals. Uh, it's amazing. So there's this tremendous other. So we play a simple role. Wonder, inquiry, creativity. Uh, also, there is this Latin term called homo faber. Homo faber is the idea of man the maker. There's nothing more important than uh, the need to create. Nothing more important. And this is, it lends itself, informal institutions lend themselves to the natural proclivities of human beings. All of us want to build, all of us want to uh, experience learning that is non-Cartesian. You know, kids don't come to the museum and say, now I'm doing math for my units. They say, I'm doing math and science and social studies and problem solving, having fun. Uh, and then last I, uh, no, I'm not even sure yet. <laughs> last I will say that uh, this is a place where we invite people to go down rabbit holes, to be lost. The people that work in informal science uh, institutions live in rabbit holes. I'm in a rabbit hole all the time. We love nothing more than to be in rabbit holes with guests. It's difficult in formal institutions to be in a rabbit hole. So, I said last thing, one more last thing. Uh, we actually, and I'm not an indication of this, we are actually very good communication, uh, communicators of uh, science, technology, engineering, math. Very, very good communicators. And so we can sort of normalize and filter what's happening in science, technology, engineering, math, and make it popular for the public. Thank you, Dr. Corbin. Uh, Hillary, you have a business and industry perspective as a leader of the industry. And as well as working with the Charlotte Area Science Network for CASM. Uh, what can you tell us about the value of science learning using free choice learning experiences? Uh, what, is it, what is the importance of feeding or resourcing the uh, intrinsically motivated science learning? Right, thanks, Dan. I'll reiterate with Robert. Um, this is a fantastic um, first inaugural summit. I'm really excited about it and, and just happy to see the university of folks in the room here today, so I appreciate it. Um, a couple of things on the value, what we see overall. Um, one, in other words, just the wow factor. You know, informal science um, education um, overall, or uh, your choice, as you would say it, you know, you, you do have your choice. You stop and, and go wow at something. Uh, John Wendell over here, um, meteorologist, he said one of the most popular pages, you know, at the Charlotte Observer is the weather page, page because people go, wow, it's a tornado. You heard Sharon Decker speak about it earlier. And, it's a, uh, you know, they, there are those settings where you can create the wow factor, and that's what draws people into science, I think, overall. Um, the other the other piece I think that is so important is, I just call it that access. It, it, is, it is really informal science education, free choice learning is in lots of different pockets. It's in the media, it's in the museum centers, it's in gaming online, it's just in a variety of things. So there is actually access for people to reach it versus the, the, the formal school system. Um, and it's all ages. Um, you know, we, we tend to think of sometimes with the younger children and the students as learners, but I learn all the time. And, and um, when I put as a, a you know, employee in a, a large, very complex um, business, um, we need to learn all the time. We need to, to learn new information. We need to re-innovate. So I think having those options and the variety is critically important, and it doesn't just happen within the walls of a school system. Um, while those are extremely important, um, the, the three choices are important. And uh, feeding the intrinsically motivated science learner, I have two teenage boys, and so I ter interpret this as, as um, the, you, they, eat, they eat when they're hungry, when they're interested, it's you know not necessarily just when you feed them, right. and they eat constantly. <laughs> and if something is very attractive looking to them, they go right to it. And so things like in the, in the museum setting or these other settings, people will be drawn to it and consume it and be excited and nourished by it um, overall in that setting. So it's a huge value. Well, I think that's a great setup for uh, Lucas. <laughs> Lucas has an instructional technologist in a school system in North Carolina. You're utilizing gaming and video games as a new model for instruction, but to meet much of what Hillary was just mentioning. What is it about the learner and your understanding of learner interests that led you to adopt gaming as an instructional methodology? Well, again, I, I echo 
how awesome it is to be here. Um, and, and thank you for uh, allowing us as educators to have a voice in this discussion. And, uh, and that, that's what an honor. Um, so, Jamie, the best thing for me to do to explain this would be really to tell a story. And I, I, I've got a limited amount of time, and I can tell the story and we'll let it go on and on. So I'll, I'll try to sum it up. Um, Around my third year of teaching, um, I, I had a student, I was teaching high school science, and, and I had a student who, who came to me and said, Mr. G, I'm saying that you're not so good. Mr. G, you, uh, you, you talk about um, your interest in fantasy literature, and I know you like games, but don't you play this game called Everquest? And Everquest, I had seen it in the store, and it was kind of a fantasy game, you know, knights and dragons and dwarves and all that stuff, online world. That sounds cool, that sounds cool. And I got the price of $10 per month to play. Who would pay for a game? And then keep paying to play it. But it said 30 days free. The first, okay. The first one's always free, right? That's where they hook you. That's, that's where they hook you. And, and so I, I, I started that out, and, and, um, and I met with um, this student, this particular student in this virtual world. He was a dwarf, and I was an elf, and we had a common goal together. We wanted to go and explore this dungeon together. And as we're running through this world, and, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, just having total brain buzz moments. We had a lot of time, because there's a lot of money in this game. And I said, have you studied your physical science? <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, no, I'm in football practice, so I didn't make it out to the review session. And I said, well, here, let's do this. I'll put, I'll put myself to auto-follow you, and I'll start eating the questions. So, uh, what are the three parts of that? What, you know, we went on and on and on as so we're dodging wolves and, and, and all these other monsters going to our destination. And, and that laid the groundwork. It was students and their, what their interests were um, that, that drew me into this. Fast forward now to, to the current time, and I moved, moved into a position now where, as an instructional panelist, I can start really, and I'm in a small district. So there's not a lot of bureaucracy, not a lot of red tape to go through. And I can start thinking about these things. And I'm in a situation that is not risk averse. We can try things. We can fail. And that's okay. You know, if we fail, we fail. We'll try something else. And so I pitched it to my team. I said, I got this game called World of Warcraft. And you may have heard of it. Um, and they were just looking at me like, what are you talking about? I said, I want to bring at-risk middle schoolers into this space. At-risk? You know, kids who, you know, these kids jump and bounce off the walls when you're trying to teach them, I will bring them here. And I want to give them an opportunity to, while they're playing this game, look at things like leadership, look at things like their ability to communicate with each other, and, and let's read and write. I mean, there's tons of reading in this game and problem solving. Let's just explore that space and see what happens. And so that's where my journey began because I, I love games. I knew my kids love games, and I knew that this was game what games. What's special about games? When you guys play games, either sports or solitaire when the, when the boss is not looking or whatever, you play games. And what is it about games? It's those three things that, that Dan Meek mentioned. You know, it's that autonomy, that mastery, that purpose. All three of those elements are component of games. So why, where is that in our classroom? And so those are the questions that drove me to do that again. Thank you, Mr. G. <laughs> I have a new term on that one of use, that is brain buzz. Brain buzz. <laughs> so uh, we've been uh, exploring and defining free choice learning, and we're attempting to in this first section. I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, the role of advancing uh, in North Carolina science and technology uh, with regard to free choice learning. So back to you, Dr. Corbin. Um, I just get a news report. Uh, we have been exploring <laughs> We've been exploring and defining our free choice learning experiences so far. So now, should free choice learning be considered uh, as a central tool in the educational tool chest? And if so, uh, to what degree? What is the role uh, of free choice learning experiences in the educational ecosystem? And what is the usefulness, potential effectiveness, or contribution of free choice learning experiences in the STEM education pipeline? So that's a fantastic question. Um, so informal learning has been classically considered an adjunct to what happens in education. It's, uh, it's the sub-narrative, well, it's not the central narrative. And I would suggest to you, I would plant the seed, plant the possibility that it's actually central to narrative. Um, we are thought of as not actually using rigor in measuring what happens from pre-post, but there is tremendous opportunity. And we have um, actually 
at the starting place and among the grassroots science museum collaborative, we have started to talk about and think about measuring what happens from pre to post as a consequence of, for example, engaging teachers in the principles of free choice learning. What happens if you truly use inquiry-based instruction? What happens if you truly do allow choice? What happens if you do allow students to engage in longitudinal, long-term exploration of real community problems? And how do you use STEM in order to solve the problem? What happens from pre to post? Well, it turns out that you can create very compelling, valid, and reliable shifts in attitudes and achievement among teachers and students. So imagine, if you will, co-constructing what it is that we assess. Now, I'm going to be a little critical of formal education now, and I think I have the right to do that having taught for 20 years in high school, and having taught in, uh, quote, unquote, a successful school and an unsuccessful school. One of the real problems we have in formal education is there is sort of a tyranny of standardized testing. There is a cultural fear among teachers. So how do we take teachers out of the context of their schools where they're afraid and allow them to actually pursue thinking that would allow them to transform attitudes and achievement for their students and themselves. You know, after all, if these teachers are longer in front of these kids for the majority of the time, how do we inspire them? How do we show them pathways that will allow themselves and their students to be successful? So I would say to you that it is critical. It is an imperative aspect of the narrative. Uh, and we shouldn't just measure what it is all these NCDPI. We shouldn't just measure what it is that NCDPI tells us to measure. Uh, there are businesses in here that have particular aptitudes, attitudes, uh, skills that are required. So why would we not measure what happens with those particular skills from the above? We have things that we would like to see achieved in informal education in the museum. We want students, uh, kids, adults to be inspired. So we need to measure whether they are inspired, what happens when we get We also, of course, want to know what happens along lines in the formal curriculum, right? So if you will, what I'm suggesting here, you know, to steal the words of my colleague, is we need to put some sugar on the pill. Put some sugar on the pill. Informal education could put sugar on the pill in order to provide the skills that are necessary for us to be competitive in the world. If we're serious about being competitive in the world, consider informal education as not an adjunct to narrative, but central. The but watch that that's radical thinking, <laughs> trying to create thinkers all over numbers. <laughs> uh, Hillary, in STEM education, uh, the concepts of rigor and relevance are often discussed, and Dr. Corbin mentioned uh, both of them. You heard from the introduction a reference to the three integrated elements as part of the culture of innovation, expertise, creative thinking skills, and motivation. If there is to be an increased focus on free choice learning experiences and potentially adding emphasis to the relevance and motivation for the learner, uh, do we potentially dilute or undermine rigor? Uh, what do these choices mean for North Carolina in cultivating an effective 21st century science and technology workforce? Thank you. Um, you know, rigor versus uh, uh, Relevance, you need both, in my opinion, and, and it does not undermine at all if you actually need both. I think the, the relevance, um, a lot of times, is that informal science education. Again, you're looking at where um, people are interested, what's relevant in the world, where the business partners and the needs that they have. Um, but you also must have the rigor in the, the education systems overall and in how you're evaluating the informal science education as well. Um, to, to have excellence. And um, one of the things I just wanted to speak to overall, yeah, I've, been, I've been at Duke Energy quite a while, um, about 26 years, um, there with the company, and it's, you know, the energy industry is a complex industry. Very interesting, we've been around over 100 years, um, a very large company. Um, one of the things that keeps me up at night and when I think of innovation is, you know, our workforce, where's Marty? Uh, I think she said 47 was the average age. We're even over that. We're into the 50s is the average age of our worker. Um, we are very heavy in STEM skills, engineers, scientists, you know, financial folks, as well as high STEM learners needed in our craft areas. Um, but so, we, you know, in the future here, we have a, we look for a large turnover workforce. And based on, you know, what we heard earlier, 
we're going to be fighting for all those engineers and scientists and others. The, and the, what's scary to me is, you know, we need them, but we also need to have our suppliers have um, these skills. We need our customers to have these skills so that they remain viable businesses. So it's that whole ecosystem, and we, we are going to be competing with that. Um, innovation um, is critical. Um, just from a couple of levels, and I could go on forever, so I'll try to keep this very concise, but um, I've, I'm the Director of Sustainability at Duke Energy. Sustainability in our newly merged organization falls under a department we call Innovation and Integration. Um, that is the name of it. We are paired with our Advanced Technology Group and our Business Process Improvement Group. So we're looking at process efficiency, sustainability is that long-term thinking of um, blending economic, social, and environmental decision making, and then with our advanced technology, and you've heard of the day, the disruptive changes is happening, <laughs> and it will be happening, in, especially in the energy industry. So we need, we need um, innovators on all levels. A um, couple of other quick things related to um, innovation. I think it is so right that you need, you need both the, the, the right and left brain skills um, to be innovative in a company. Um, lots of engineers and lots of scientists um, can't communicate very well, you know, overall. Um, and sometimes some very great, wonderful, creative people don't have a systematic method of, of going about things to get the results. So, so you really need a blend of both, I think, to, to, to solve those problems in a creative way that's effective, and fast, and efficient. So I say we really do need it all um, overall. So we, I, I think very much we need this informal as well as the formal um, folks working together. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, what can you tell us about the potential usefulness, effectiveness, or contribution of gaming as an instructional methodology in the STEM education pipeline? And what are the anticipated outcomes for the learner uh, uh, in experiencing gaming and what you've designed? How might gaming not only advance the interest in science and technology, but advance understanding and advance the integrated nature of science and technology? And I think one of the things that, uh, to talk about theories, one of the things that we have done that, that games are the basic of the opposite of is that we have stigmatized failure. And that is a, when you think about, um, for example, let me go back to what we work as an example. If I'm a player, I've invested a large amount of time to level my character up, and I've reached level. 89, I think it is now. Um, and I get that last big challenge. There's this huge dragon, and I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, or whatever. And I'm working with 40 other people to accomplish this goal, and we fail. The game mechanic does not send me back to level one, and I have to reinvest all of that time again to get back to that point. And so players know that. And so they, they become more willing to take risks. Let's try something new. I need you guys to go back here and stand back further from the, from the monster, and I need you healing, and I need you guys to use your ice spell rather than your fire spell. And it's all that, and, and really what I'm talking about here is, is a bigger picture kind of thing. It's this idea of experimentation without risk of, of failure or, or punitive um, outcomes for failure. And, and, but that's exactly what we do in our schools. I can have a student, when I was teaching biology, it was possible, it never happened, but it was possible, I not let it happen, but it was possible that a student could get through my entire 90-day course in biology and come up with 69.4. And what would that mean? Now, in gamer terms, what does, that do? what does it mean to have a 69.4? That means I've mastered almost 70% of this content. All right? But, that you cut off there. And what do we do? We say, sorry, I'll see you again next semester. Same teacher, same material. We're not going to change it. We're going to do the same thing again. And then, well, that's a tragedy. Do you think that motivates the child to keep doing things, to try new things? It, it does. And so I think one of the things that games, the promise of gaming is not so much the games themselves, but the games as a model uh, or, or a, an outlook or an approach. It's to say, let's, let's, let's experiment without risk of failure. Um, let's, or rather, let's fail a lot and, and see what happens. And when that doesn't work, let's try something new. And when it comes to STEM education, you think about it. Think about your science teachers and your science classes. How many of you remember the lectures? I don't know how many. How many of you remember the labs? Right? We remember those labs, right? Because we were hands-on. We had an experience. 
And that's the thing that games give us, is they give us an experience, and the, and the learning is situated in an experience, in a context for it. And that's what good games, and, and that idea of gaming brings to the table, is that, hey, now we're getting to a point where, where we can start doing that. If you haven't looked at games lately, we've come a long way since Pac Man. Right? <laughs> I mean, it is you know, incredibly complex, and, and our ability to create environments and create worlds is far beyond. And, and there's technology coming out this year, even, that's going to even blow that out of the way. When we start wearing virtual reality headsets and you know, I'm actually there or I feel like I'm in that space, imagine that. So, yeah, okay, I can take that and go out and kill some dragons or whatever, but what if I took that and I went inside the cell? And I started exploring the cell. And what if that cell was under a, you know, was, was in danger of becoming cancerous? And all of a sudden, there's a name in front of it, and I can try different things to actually figure out a way to overcome that. You know? and, and so that's to me, that's what the promise of it lies. And, and the problem is, is that we, we've got to change fundamental, some of our fundamental views and paradigms about um, public education. And I think we can do that. I don't think it's hopeless. I think we can do that. Um, but, but games are just one way of looking at that, one lens. And there's, there's a variety of other lenses. I'm waiting for all of that. <laughs> um, so in this last section, we're going to try to explore the linkages between free choice learning and formal STEM education. So uh, Dr. Corbin, earlier I asked you what you thought was the usefulness, the potential effectiveness or contribution of free choice learning experiences in the STEM education pipeline. Uh, now, tell us specifically uh, about Discovery Place Science Center, working with other science centers in the North Carolina and Western Science Museums, or other networks, and uh, the connections or potential connections free choice learning experiences have to a formal STEM education in North Carolina. Another great question, thank you. Um, imagine, if you will, a collaborative where uh, science methods, math methods, engineering methods, teachers, uh, got together with those that are actually doing research. They're doing STEM-based research. And they got together and they said, here are the research that we can provide for children. And we can measure what happens from pre to post as a consequence of our working together. Now, I mentioned before that I don't put the teaching teachers that we get in when CC actually she mentioned that. About if you took your methods teachers and you embedded them in schools with students in enrichment programs, and you deliver the very best of what is known about teaching science, technology, engineering, and math in partnership with engineers and scientists from research institutions like NC State, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, UNCC, uh, UNCC, Green Bay, Johnson C. Smith, etc. Well, we are doing that um, at the Story Place. And we have measured, again, amazing change from pre to post and attitudes and achievement. One of the things that we cannot lament in our culture, folks, is our inability to be successful in science, technology, engineering, and math if it is possible to teach in the state of North Carolina science in an elementary school without having a single content course in science, technology, engineering, and math. There's a reason why the elementary school table is missing from the STEM scorecard. You know, we can't just uh, take a sixth and seventh grader and say, okay, now we're going to do science, right? We're going to do science, technology, engineering, and math from the onset, we have to have teachers who have the confidence, the skills, the mental affordances to do so. So this particular model I've described very briefly is called prototypation. Uh, it stands for prototype and innovate. There's another aspect which is really important, which has to do with assessment. Imagine that uh, the museum uh, members of the museum collaborative were hubs in all the cities in the Carolinas. And they went into school and met with instructional leaders and they said, we want to provide an extraordinary enrichment opportunity for you in collaboration with universities. But what we need to know from you is where are your deficits? Where are you failing in science, technology, engineering, and math along standardized course of study or the new essential standards? Um, where are you failing? And then the 35 members of the uh, Rational Science Museum Collaborative went and depicted how to teach those concepts using free choice, wonder, integration, creativity, etc. Imagine what would be possible. We're talking about transformation. We have done pilot studies now, we've done this three years now, and we have seen transformation 
from predisposed in terms of attitudes and achievement. Not only that, but tailored transformation, specific to kids that have bases in schools, right? I love this quote by Wendell Berry, who said, it's not possible to think globally and act globally. It's only possible to think globally and act globally. Meet with people that are in schools. Imagine this being replicated through all the Carolinas with museums as hubs, where we have method teachers and researchers working together on behalf of students and teachers. Now just imagine the student to teacher ratio. Imagine what can happen if you have method students, those that aspire to improve their craft as teachers, working with scientists, and you have five students to every adult in the classroom as part of an enrichment opportunity. That is another aspect. It is not just raising the level of STEM attitudes and achievement among the entire American populace. It is what do we do to raise the level of enrichment for those that have self-identified, those that will be the leaders in science, technology, and engineering math. We need to give very, very focused, longitudinal opportunities for kids to develop their skills in science, technology, and engineering math. That is what we're doing. Uh, thanks to the help of Girls Welcome and the SMT, uh, we are embarking upon a pilot project where we are going to determine with that and talk about the importance of failure. That is spot on. So if you fail, and if, if, if what it is that you deliver is not doing really well, immediately be transparent about that. Change it, talk to the people that you're working with uh, in higher education, in K-12 schools, in business. Give business as a role, right? Uh, we talk about this in the Experience Committee all the time, so you can't expect a researcher for somebody that is employed in a business to give seven days in a row of enrichment to kids. But we can provide a capstone experience where people can come in and depict really cool stuff that they do in science, technology, engineering, and math. Last thing we said, there's tremendous hope in the work of uh, Jamie Noah Griffith, the importance of the school time. Uh, we have yet to find a way to provide sustaining opportunity for kids to do truly engaging science, technology, engineering, math. But there is tremendous hope and research that already been established to show what can happen in terms of transforming attitudes and achievement in science, technology, engineering, math, in camps, in the after school time, etc. Uh, your science museums can be a hub of that, and we would love nothing more than to be able to do that. So thank you for listening to me now on uh, Dr. Corbett, I just uh, want to interject the thought of you were just uh, a little earlier talking about that individualized drive and motivation for, for learning and how we're in a new era. It reminds me that this uh, recently we were just celebrating the uh, uh, anniversary of the development of the cell phone and the gentleman, I don't recall his name, the one who invented it, said something quite uh, uh, remarkable to me and I you know, obviously look at everything through the educational lens. And he said, at the time when that was being developed, we used phones to call homes, and now we use phones to call people. And that's really striking that, that, that if you look at education that way in that we're moving increasingly. We saw the information on the tablet and, and computer uh, technology and how it's evolved. Uh, individualized learning, individualized drives, uh, we're getting more and more to putting the, the onus on the learner and empowering and resourcing the learner to drive their own lives, to drive their own uh, career, developing their own, their own pipeline. So thank you for your remarks. I just have to that. Hillary, in your work with the our Charlotte Area Science Network, uh, what do you see are the connections or potential connections towards learning experiences to the formal STEM education system in North Carolina? And what might be the value that formal education systems place or don't place on free choice learning experiences when it comes to STEM education and STEM workforce for parents? Thanks. Um, first, I'll just explain what the Charlotte Area Science Network is, um, just a, a little background on that. Um, gosh, it was about 10 years ago in Charlotte, we um, realized there were a lot of different organizations that that we're running across each other, are all interested in propelling science, technology, engineering, math, and skills, both with helping students and also with um, uh, just the general public. We had, um, you know, university organizations where a lot of, for example, the Sigma Xi Scientific Research Honor Society was 
giving grants for lecturers to come in um, as for the different university uh, systems. We had um, businesses that were doing uh, grants to help um, overall with that. We had museum centers that were bringing in and doing different really cool shows. We had the American Chemical Society in town that was that had their own budget and were doing some things and we realized, you know, again, with that idea of innovation and collaboration, mm -hmm. you know, if we all paired together and at a minimum just knew what each other were doing and maybe had the similar distribution lists, we could leverage without any spending any more resources and really consolidate and and um, leverage from each other. So we formed a um, very loose organization called the Charlotte Area Science Network and it's still to this day it's very grassroots, very low budget, but the whole purpose is to, to connect and to leverage um, what other folks are doing. And, and we've seen so much happen um, that has connected the informal and the formal um, uh, uh, science learning as well as the business connections. And um, for example, in that, given net, in that given network on a given day, the conversation would be um, uh, the, the science fairs, for example, a local science fair. The UNC Charlotte hosts that science fair. Um, they call around, get all the various judges from these various organizations to be engaged um, in that. Um, uh, you know, when the media partners may promote it, um, and uh, it's just it's really leveraged some of the existing resources that are there already. Um, so that's an important um, relationship, and a, a big shout out to all the different organizations that are involved with that um, across the spectrum. But I really I think it speaks to, um, you know, uh, when you collaborate and when you have a diverse group of thinkers in collaboration, you come up with a way better result. Thank you. Being part of a collaborative, I know that. Um, Lucas, uh, with your working in an informal education system, what can you tell us about how free choice learning experiences are viewed or valued? Or again, not. How do you see the relationship between free choice learning experiences and the formal education system evolving through time? That's a great question, too. Um, we're, we're at a crossroads in public in, in education in general, in any kind of um, time we talk about stuff like like free choice learning. Um, people, there's just one or two responses. There, there's sort of, there's, there's classroom teachers who are embracing this and, and are, are really tapping into students' passions about the, the things that they are interested in and allowing them to follow the, the, those pathways um, in, as it relates to whatever it is they're teaching them. But, then they, but a lot of our schools, everything's blocked. We block it. You know, and, and we're, and I would suggest that maybe that free choice learning is going on anyway. Whether it happens in our schools or not, they're doing it. And, and if you don't believe me, walk into any of our middle or high schools, and at the end of the day, the bell rings. A child walks across the threshold of the classroom, and what do they do? And they take a breath of air because I'm suddenly connected again to my network and to the things that I want and the things that I need to know. It's right here, and it's in their pocket. But we deny them the access to this often, not always but often not in the access to this information and these connections and things. And, and so what I would suggest, just based off of what I've seen with the gaming, but it, it, it's in everything. Um, when I started working with the game Minecraft in our district, I, I faced the challenge of setting up a server. And, and so I wanted to create a world where the students at our seven different schools that were using the program could all get in that same space and interact together and build it and create together. And um, I, I, I had no computer you know, just programming, background, networking, anything like that. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's I don't know to be dangerous as well. I tell people. Um, but, so what did I do? I went to YouTube. And guess what? I found a, a, a perfect step-by-step -step set of instructions on how to set up a Mac Mini as your Minecraft server. Guess who taught me? A 12-year-old British kid. <laughs> and, 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 and do I value that? I don't care if he's 12 years old. He has something that I need. And so if we establish a, set, a system where, as an educator, I, I put students in a position where they say, you know what, I'm not going to be the expert on this technology stuff, and that's okay, you can teach me. But guess what, I probably know more about biology than you do, and let me teach you, we'll trade. And likewise, I want you to show me what you know about um, ecology, 
But if you want to do it with Minecraft, you do it with Minecraft. You teach me about files using Minecraft. If you want to do it by creating a web page or, or by setting up a, a, a fake Twitter conversation or whatever it is that you want to do, what you use, what's important to you to demonstrate that learning, then how much more valuable for the student? And that shows the student that we value them. But the problem is we've got to move our classrooms and our teachers, and, and, and really, the teachers are, are very willing. We just got to enable them. And we've got to take down some of those walls and, and get rid of that fear mentality. Oh gosh, what if they go to a bad website? They do that all the time. <laughs> I, I click something and I'm like, whoa. But that didn't, you know, didn't mean to see that, but that doesn't show up in my search history. <laughs> but, but they're there. And, and rather than blocking them and keeping them out of these spaces, you know, this is the Wild West. We're, they're going into the Wild West unattended. Why not have wise adults guide them through those spaces together? And so we've got to move in that direction, whether it's with gaming, whether it's with social media, whether it's iPads, whatever. We, as adults, have to now help our kids navigate that space together rather than prevent them from getting into it. And so that's the challenge. Um, and, and some school systems are moving in that direction, and others are still locked in fear. And, and one way or another, it's coming. And I, I kind of use a, an analogy. If, if I was standing at the base of the Hoover Dam, there's a little, like, a little bit of water shooting out, I stick my finger in it, or block that hole, put some bubble gum down here, and something, and hold a hand here. You can only block so many lakes, and eventually that thing's coming down. And it's, the world is going to change. You talk about disruption. Education is ripe for disruption. Um, replay Chris's book, um, Disrupting Class. Uh, I mean, you, you, all the factors are in place. So it's just a matter of time. The question is, as, as a system of education, do we embrace that and, and, and move forward with it, or do we fight against it and get trampled in the process? So. Hillary, do we have time for questions? Um, sure, we take a few Any questions? Yes. <laughs> just a quick e, what you were you referring to just now? Um, Disrupting Class by Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen. I have to give a plug. Um, we brought in for the 2011 Emerging Issues Forum to talk about sort of um, healthcare innovation. So. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Early on, uh, you had mentioned destigma. Destigmatizing failure. Um, have you flipped that over and thought about the fact that there is not a kid in any middle or high school in the state that doesn't know who is the top athlete in football, baseball, basketball in his or her school, and probably most of them around. Oh, oh, when was the last time you saw the president of the chess club, or the science club, or the guy who actually did win the robotics context, um, treated to the same celebrity? Um, I, I'd like to put forth that, that part of our problem is we don't market ourselves very well. That's, that's, I totally agree, and, and that's something that, that I try to encourage my teachers. One of the things, I've been in some discussions with a guy named Sean Dickers from Ohio State University, and, and he interviewed me about how it was that I, I, as a classroom teacher, made that transition to where I suddenly feel bold enough to try crazy things, like World of Warcraft for middle schoolers. <laughs> and, and what I told him was that the key factor was that networking piece and, and connecting with other people and, and sharing what I was doing and connecting other people who doing crazy things too. And realizing, hey, there's a bunch of crazy people out there, I'm okay. And, and so one of the things I tell teachers is that you've got to market what you're doing in your classroom. And the teachers are shy. They, they, there's that, I, generally speaking, I think they're a little, there's a confidence issue. I don't, I, I, how many times have you ever heard somebody say, I'm just a teacher? I'm not just a teacher, you're a teacher. <laughs> you know, and, and that's incredible. And, and we need to market the things that we're doing in our classroom, these cool, innovative sorts of things, because that's where education, in my, my opinion, that's where education reforms happen. It's happening in an individual classroom, with individual teachers and students. And, and it, it will push up from there. Um, I, I'm not sure about top down, but, but we have to mark that. Uh, if I may, I'd like to add something to that um, with respect to teachers. Teachers, teachers require a space to fail. 
uh, again, I won't go into the tyranny at all. I have been with teaching teachers for years and years and years, and a lifelong advocate for teachers. They need to have a space, imagine that space, where they could go to tinker, to engage in the faith movement, to uh, concern with technology, to learn about new strategies, to see how that works, and then to use formative assessment in order to adjust what they do. I think you'd be surprised if you interview teachers from pre-K all the way through high school, if you ask them the number of times they actually had an observation with a meaningful debriefing, I think you would be very, very surprised at the answer. Particularly as it relates to content and science technology you're doing that. There's the need to do that. There's one more thing I want to say about informal education that I left off that's really important. Tall levels of shit. Informal education is pre k gray, right? It's an extraordinary cross age cauldron of learning. And that's, that's a very important thing to consider. So imagine, if you will, the labs that are in the 35 Museum, where you have grandparents, uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters, nieces, and nephews, having conversations about science, technology, and doing math. That is part of the answer of normalizing science, technology, and doing math, and celebrating the accomplishments in science, technology, and doing math. The majority of parents, sadly, I would posit, don't really know whether the kids are being successful, in science, technology, engineering, math, and school or not. I would say many of them are, are assuming that they are. And so, make it public, make it popular, make it fun. Let me add quickly, and hopefully this is addressing a little bit of what you were asking and uh, what you two uh, mentioned. There's a report that came out in 2011 called the, uh, it's called Slow Off the Mark, and it's specifically about uh, teacher licensure in the K-5 level. And one of the things that it points out is that at the K-5 level, um, what we are lacking is not the, the loss of skills development in science and technology, not the loss of competency development in science and technology, but the, 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 uh, the affective side of it, where if a teacher is not licensed or not pursuing science and technology and they go into K-5 teaching, they may exude a certain persona about science and technology that is picked up by kids, and then they place a value or they don't on science and technology. So by the time they come out of fifth grade, one to middle school and high school, that affective piece is already set. And when the skills development, competency development is trying to be accessed, as um, Dr. Houston says, then I think it's one of the, the things that contributes to what, what kids no, they don't want to do because some of the affective pieces are not in place because a teacher may not have been excited and just, um, uh, just been electric about science and technology. And maybe leads to a little bit of that uh, dulling of that star effect you were talking about. You don't have enthusiasm. Exactly. Especially at that young age where we're just trying to get them excited and charged. Okay. Well, let me real quickly just mention. I'm sorry. You're fine. The musical chairs there. I want to. I have to thank uh, Sam Houston and Charlie Goble and uh, Ken Jenkins for uh, seeing the value, the importance as educators, of, and including informal science education into the. STEM scorecard. Uh, they, uh, as educators, experienced educators and researchers, uh, it's got to see the value and the role of informal science education, free choice learning. And uh, one of the things that I see going forward is working with the North Carolina Science Museums to uh, recognize that they're being asked to play that role and to see if they can find a higher game. Thank you very much, Sir Gail. And looking at the top, and, lo and looking at the top ideas that you have, um, that you've been looking at, that was on your program when you got here, you know, I'm looking at it, and I see that several of these ideas um, touch upon critical thinking, motivating STEM experiences, and partnering with the North Carolina, Carolina North, North Carolina Science Museum. So there will certainly be a lot to talk about in this next session um, of the day.
So as Anita mentioned earlier today, the ultimate goal of the Science Summit uh, is to generate action. That was the main purpose, that was the reasoning um, for, you know, for why we're here in the first place. Um, so I just want to give you a heads up of what's going to happen um, at, after today. Uh, the partnership is going to meet, the partnership members will meet in May um, to determine the best way to communicate the top ideas that are going to be generated this afternoon. We're going to communicate those to uh, relevant stakeholders and decision makers. Uh, next, these ideas will be carried into a series of post-summit community events around the state that will be hosted by the North Carolina Science Festival, and you'll hear more about that um, and how that's going to happen this afternoon. Um, we've asked you to log in to the Emerging Issues Commons workspace um, during the breaks. And so um, I want to just go over the three ways that you can access that workspace because you're going to be going there using it um, shortly. So first, you can use your own smartphone, laptop, tablet, whatever you brought with you today. Um, two, we've got tablets and laptops available. We've got some staff that will be floating around if you could raise your hand in the back. So if you've not done it, you need some help, um, they'll be walking over to the tables um, during this next discussion to help you go ahead and do that. Um, or you can go straight to the touch tables that are in the Emerging Issues Commons. You won't need a profile to do that. You can just go in and rank um, and comment there. Terrific. So, and I'm sorry, I'm just kind of all over the place here. But um, so now I want to transition everyone to this idea of prioritization. So in the program and on the screen right now, we've recapped the four key challenges. And as Anita explained, we now have two tools, one brand new with the scorecard and the recently revised uh, innovation index that John described today. And we had one scorecard with six domains, and then John had about six domains, and some of them overlapped. But what we did is took them up a couple levels and uh, identified four key challenges that we think encompass all of the indicators, or most of the indicators that John and Sam have been able to capture and collect. So these again are the four key challenges. You can read them here today. How do we graduate college and career ready students at all levels that can navigate the science and technology pipeline? How can the state produce, retain, and continue to develop quality science, technology, engineering, and math teachers, how can we engage the public and decision makers to support science and technology, learning and economic development, and how can the innovative ideas of researchers and companies move into commercial products and the marketplace? So, before the summit, we invited all of you and the other invited guests to offer ideas to address e each of these four key challenges in that science summit workspace, um, created specifically for this purpose. They could, you all could comment on ideas as well as rank other ideas on the criteria of feasibility, effectiveness, and innovation. More than 30 ideas were shared. Earlier this month, the Pathways Partnership reviewed these ideas and identified three ideas under each of these four key challenge questions, questions to bring forward for us to discuss and prioritize this afternoon. And uh, your worksheet here has uh, a title for it and a, and a small bit of a description. So we've got the early integration of critical thinking, connecting students to industry experience, early childhood STEM experiences, high quality professional development, expand the North Carolina Teacher Corps, top down support for emerging tech, elevating the Board of Science and Technology, partnering with the North Carolina Science Museums, a next generation legislative committee, entrepreneurial collaboratory, enhance higher education proof of concept, and matching funds for business development. What we want you to do at each table, actually before I get started, you know, it's really important to thank the Pathways Partnership members. Um, we've been actually meeting monthly. Some folks on the, on the team have been meeting um, even weekly by phone um, and always available. So I want to take a moment to, you saw their names on the screen, but if anyone that is a Pathways, Pathways Partnership member, organization representative that's here in the room, if you could please just stand up and re be recognized, because if it wasn't for you and the work you did, we, we wouldn't have this great agenda today. So please stand up and, and be recognized. Mm -hmm. 
So throughout this afternoon, we have at least one Pathways partner um, at each table who will be helping to fa facilitate both the statewide conversation we're going to have now as well as the regional action planning that will take place after. So first, we're going to ask that each of you spend about 30 to 35 minutes talking at your table through each of the 12 ideas at your table. So we want you to consider your unique perspective and what you bring. So you, whether it's formal education, uh, free choice learning, whether it's economic development, venture capital, or whatever hat you wear, um, be considering that. I want you to ask for clarity and ask questions. If you really understand the STEM learning aspect and that's the hat you bring to the table, you might not be clear what uh, proof of concept is. And so this is an opportunity to educate, share, talk with one another. I do want to have Sam um, Houston will be roaming around the room for those of you that have questions specifically to the education STEM learning or any question you had about the scorecard. And then uh, John Hardin will also be roaming if you have any questions about what you heard in his index um, and these ideas here. Let's see. So we're only going to be discussing the 12 ideas. That's not to say that you don't have a great idea that's very distinct from these 12. Each table will have a parking lot, oh, excuse me, a bike rack sheet for those of you in active transportation. Um, we'll have a bike rack, and we want to hear what those are because this is just the first of what we hope is much work ahead and, and many more meetings, and so we do want to hear what those are. Um, the combining or refining of ideas, we can start talking about that, but we can do that more in the regional action planning phase. And in terms of um, really getting down into the details of the who, how, when, and how these ideas would actually uh, take place, we're not going to focus too much on that right now, um, other than trying to determine if it's a feasible um, uh, idea to, to move forward with. But we will get into all of that in the regional action planning. Okay, and so I'm going to go ahead and let you get started, and um, we do have break service in the back, so please go ahead and, and uh, grab a, a snack or a drink, and I'm going to remind you at a little bit after 3 o'clock to go ahead and make sure you vote, and again, if you have trouble logging in or you need help creating a profile, please raise your hand and one of us will be around the room to help you. Thank you very much.